And as our first story, NDC flag bearer hopeful Dr. Kwabna Dufour says he will fix the alien Ghanaian economy within two years of his presidency if elected in 2024. Now, Kwabna Dufour, who was the finance minister under the John Evans at a Mills presidency, is optimistic his plan to bring the country to prosperity will materialize within two years and therefore appeals to delegates to give him the opportunity to lead the NDC. He made these promises during his campaign toward the Greater Accra region. Samuel Mbura has more on this report. According to Dr. Dufo, he is contesting the elections with the aim of ending the sufferings of Ghanaians when given the nod to lead the country. <laughs> The bush rat does not go out in the afternoon, but when it does, there is a problem. That is why I am out to solve that problem. I am in the context because I want to take you out from the current economic challenges. We are hungry as Ghanaians despite the abundant resources. The founder of the party built it for the poor masses. However, this power has been taken from you, and I will ensure it is returned to you when giving the nod. He is optimistic of fixing the ailing Ghanaian economy within two years of his presidency. If we recapture power, the economy will be brought back to life. We have done it before under the Professor Atamos regime. We will repeat same strategies to ensure that inflation is reduced by stabilizing the city and Ghana will become prosperous again. As inflation surges, making living conditions unbearable for Ghanaians, Dr. Dufour promises to fix the situation. In my first year, the city will rise again to make the economy more robust. In my second year, the growth of the economy will accelerate faster. We have the resources, so why must we be hungry? We have the money in the country if only we cut back expenditures. The first year will stabilize the economy. Second year, you're a bit too big. So far, the campaign team of Dr. Kwabner Dufour has visited the Pong Kantamaso constituency, the Ningo Pram Pram constituency, to propagate their message of better livelihoods for Ghanaians when he is elected into office. The team is expected to move to other parts of Greater Accra as the campaign gets heated. For Joy News, Samuel Mbura, Accra. Meanwhile, the constituency executives of the NDC at Ningo Pram Pram have denied claims by other executives that there have been attempts to block campaigning with Dr. Kwabna Dufour by the MP Sam George and the chairman. Moving away from that, we go on to vaccine matters. Now, Professor Alassan Abdul Momin, a consulting pediatrician at the Tamale Teaching Hospital and Northern Regional Chairman Pediatric Society, Ghana has confirmed to join news that they've already recorded five measles related deaths at the hospital. This is coming on the back of calls by some parents in the Tamale municipality that the closure of schools should be done to prevent the spread of measles among pupils. Join news sources indicate that 16 districts have reported cases. Professor Momin says they are recording more cases. We have had, I mean, several. Um cases that required admission into the hospital. So these are the, the severe type of uh, measles, as we would call them. And out of these uh, conditions, we have a number of suspected deaths. In that, I mean, many of, I mean, some of this, so we have five recorded deaths within the Tamale Teaching Hospital since November mm -hmm. that had all the features of uh, measles. So uh, your reporter, uh, Yunus, just talked about the children having fever, having the rash. These are the cardinal features for the children that have uh, measles. So they would have fever, they would have the general rash over the whole body, and then they may develop complications. Mm -hmm. So if they do develop those complications, it may be due, uh, related to the eye, it may be related to running, diarrhea and getting uh, fluid loss in their bodies, or they may develop pneumonia, which is uh, having difficulty in breathing, fast breathing, 
and uh, needing supplemental oxygen supply. So these cases we admit to the hospital, and out of them, we've had five suspected that uh, died during this period. The reason why they are suspected is just because after you have the clinical uh, features we have talked about, mm -hmm. you still need a laboratory test to confirm that this is a case of confirmed measles. Mm -hmm. And that has been a challenge since we started experiencing this outbreak. And that's why they remain suspected, but we have suspected this. So for the teaching hospital, we recorded our first cases in November 2020. No, I mean the death. When, when, did, they, when yes. did we record So the death? first ones, I mean, in December up to now, we've had like five deaths. Mm -hmm. Okay. But we've not checked from the laboratory even since December to confirm that they were measles related. We can only say suspect. No, um, thank you so much. So we do regular, I mean, uh, follow-ups. Because these uh, samples are sent to a central laboratory in Accra, and once the testing is done, it's sent by through a software. And our public health team in the hospital and all other facilities actually check through the software to be able to tell which results have come back. Since November, we've only had 13% of the tests that we have sent returned. And uh, there is, the rest are still results are not ready, results are not ready. So because of that, you then have to depend on the clinical features that those children or other patients present with to make a diagnosis. Well, already the spike in cases is getting many parents in the northern regional capital, Tamale, very worried. You know your fact of our affiliate station reports that the number of cases continues to rise. So we know that all all 16 metropolitan municipal and district assemblies in the northern region have now recorded uh, suspected cases of measles. Mm. Uh, our checks um, across the region indicates that uh, the cases are in dozens. Uh, in some districts, we have actually um, had or we are told that, that um, cases, suspected cases have hit uh, 100 plus and health uh, officials um, in these hospitals are very worried about the situation. Um, they still uh, are calling on government to fast track efforts to uh, get these vaccines uh, into the country for uh, the hospitals to be able to handle the cases. They fear uh, it could get worse. Um, they fear we could start uh, loosened lives. Um, could you, for instance, um, in the Karaga uh, district, we are told that at least 85 suspected cases were recorded between uh, January and February alone. Uh, but the health directory there uh, told us um, some five of the suspected cases actually turned out positive. Mm. We know, uh, for instance, in the Bimbala municipality, that's the Nanumba and North Municipality, um, they've also recorded cases. In fact, uh, I spoke to one um, man there who said he lost his child and he suspects it is actually measles, even though uh, the hospital hasn't been able to confirm at uh, the cause of the death. But he says that his child was suffering um, all these symptoms the uh, flu, uh, the uh, severe fever, mm. uh, the rashes, mm. and the uh, running stomach. And so mm. he believes that um, it likely was uh, measles that okay. uh, caught the death of his, his mm. child. We can also hear from neurosurgeon Dr. Hadi Abdallah, who has also been expressing worry about the shortage of vaccines. This uh, shortage is, didn't just happen um, this, week, this month or a month ago. Over, it's been more than one year since we started experiencing the shortages. So it means that for most of the children who were born from, I mean, be, during this period from uh, since 2022, they are likely to have missed so many of these vaccines that are very crucial to their survival during the first few years of life. And the situation is quite bad because, uh, for instance, in the northern region, there is no district that has not recorded um, maybe an outbreak of measles. So all, all the 16 districts that we have in northern regions have had cases of measles. If it's just a fever and a rash, 
generally we are able to manage them as home cases. So you can send them home and then they will be uh, managed at home. But if they develop complications like the breathing problems, then they need to be in the hospital. And this is the key complication that can lead to deaths in children that have measles. And that is why this is a very big problem for I mean, all of us as a country. The long-term effects of some of these uh, infections, especially Now, staying a bit while longer on health, the World Health Organization, in partnership with Ghana's Ministry of Health, have begun processes to procure medications and equipment for the treatment of diabetes in primary health centers across the country. The move is to help with the prevention and control of diabetes as recent data share continuous increase in patients across the world. Also speaking at the WHO Ministry of Health Collaboration Spotlight on Diabetes in Ghana, Health Minister Kwekwa Jiman Menu said the partnership will help ease the global burden of diabetes by increasing access to affordable and quality healthcare by 2025. The World Health Organization and the Ministry of Health collaboration is to put the spotlight on diabetes in Ghana under the theme Promoting Partnership for Diabetes Prevention and Control. The initiative aims at increasing access to diagnostic equipment and medication and also ensure that persons living with diabetes have access to equitable, comprehensive, affordable, quality care and treatment. According to data from the WHO, 24 million adults are living with diabetes in Africa. 2.4 million of them are Ghanaians. Speaking at the event, Health Minister Kwekwa Jimamenu highlighted the importance of the partnership, saying the WHO Global Diabetes Compact will provide a framework for addressing the challenges and improve diabetes prevention. Can I sign on to the WHO Global Diabetes Compact in response to the increasing burden of diabetes around the world? The compact aims to reduce the global burden of diabetes by increasing access to affordable and quality care, promoting a more comprehensive approach to diabetes prevention and management, and addressing the social determinants of health that contribute to the diabetes epidemic. Medical officer working on diabetes with the World Health Organization, Dr. Bianca Hemmingsen, explained the importance of the partnership. The initiative of making this spotlight is an actual initiative led by the World Health Organization country office in uh, Ghana and the Minister of Health. Uh, and it's really important to put diabetes on the agenda. It's very amazing when you're coming from the outside to see all this commitment you have in Ghana on NCDs. You have the Minister of Health talking about diabetes and putting it on the agenda and you have a very large civil society who also supports the diabetes work. Already now, Ghana actually has quite a lot of uh, very nice initiatives um, around Ghana on non-communicable diseases, including diabetes already. So uh, it's, uh, I think Ghana is really uh, good at prioritizing this global burden that we are facing. President of the Ghana Diabetes Association, AC Denyo, touched on the benefits of the initiative. I think it's uh, beautiful and I think the best so far that has happened in the history of Ghana that we are grabbing NCDs, especially diabetes by the horn, to tackle it on a strategic level involving the World Health Organization, the Norwegian government and the Ministry of Health. Dr. Prebo Parango is a medical officer for the Intercountry Support Team for Eastern and Southern Africa at the World Health Organization. A huge burden in terms of um, what you call the um, catastrophic health expenditure. So people spend a lot of money. In fact, WHO we found out that in 2019, an average person with type 2 diabetes spends a significant proportion of his salary on on medications so he has to we don't want a situation where somebody has to decide to make that decision on either buying food and providing education for children or to buy medicine so this initiative is part of our steps in ensuring that 
access to diagnosis, treatment and care is available to the average Ghanaian. Meanwhile, the Ghana Diabetes Association is advising Ghanaians to check their sugar and blood pressure frequently. Linda Darkos reports read to you. Now to developing issues in Asham and there are growing calls for the Commander-in-Chief of the Ghana Armed Forces, President Ekufuado, to take action against officers in the military high command who sanctioned a so-called intelligence operation that saw the assault of innocent citizens in a Shaiman. The operation comes days after a soldier was killed there. Speaking on news, while panelists roundly con condemned the operation, with Professor PJ Chia describing it as an extra digital killing that will further worsen the human rights recorded in the country. The constitution, as you rightly said, the dignity of the human person is supposed to be protected. The, constitution, the same constitution talks about the fact that nobody, everybody is presumed innocent until proven guilty. What took place was an extrajudicial act aimed at brutalizing innocent people. It was claimed to be um, an intelligence-led uh, operation, but it was not. The police had a role to play. The police started something. The army came and usurped that uh, uh, responsibility placed on the police. And the police went mum, which is also very shocking and frightening if the police cannot protect us. And so in this situation, we see where rule of law has been shoved aside. Mm. We don't, it's not only the constitution that we can refer to. Ghana is a state party to the Convention Against Torture, uh, uh, Cruel and Other Forms of uh, 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 Degrading Treatment and Punishment. Ghana is a state party to that. We've had a special rapporteur visiting the country, visiting our prisons, to look at how the country's laws respect torture and how torture and other cruel inhuman degrading treatment and punishment is actually respected in the country. And the report was not very good. And so this is going to add to the stock of our record. Mm. And it's just not the right way to go. Well, Professor Kwesi Enin has also condemned the executive and parliamentary for tolerating the brutality, accusing them of failing in their oversight responsibility. So an intelligence-led operation that seizes 184 people, brutalized, and if you see the picture of that, those guys lying in mud, and, and there's a particular way in which during war, you treat people in ways that dehumanizes and takes away their sense of self-respect and humanity. So when you let them Yes, this particular picture. When you let them wade in mud, excuse my language, like pigs, what you do is that you seek to dehumanize those that you are brutalizing and teaching sense to, so that you create societies of fear and societies of abuse, where that abuse is respected and accepted as the norm. So there's a historicity to this. But something, part of my pain and, that, and this abiding sense of failure also relates to the discursive language used by our political class. So the Parliamentary Committee on Defense and Interior sympathizes not with the family, but with the Ghana Armed Forces as an institution for losing one of their personnel. That is okay. But then the parliamentary committee then says, look, we need to be careful about how we handle this case so we don't worsen it. That is not the way oversight must be done. Oversight, and particularly parliamentary oversight, dealing with interior defense and intelligence mm. is about ensuring that the public faith in these institutions are kept. Now we can listen to the demand by panelists calling on President Okufado to take action.
So an intelligence-led operation that seizes 184P, brutalized, and if you see the picture of that, those guys lying in mud, and there's a, and there's a particular way in which during war, you treat people in ways that dehumanizes and takes away their sense of self-respect and humanity. So when you let them, yes, this particular picture, when you let them wade in mud, excuse my language, like pigs, what you do is that you seek to dehumanize those that you are brutalizing and teaching sense to, so that you create societies of fear and societies of abuse, where that abuse is respected and accepted as the norm. So there's a historicity to this. But something, part of my pain, and, that, and this abiding sense of failure, also relates to the discursive language used by our political class. So the Parliamentary Committee on Defense and Interior sympathizes not with the family, but We apologize for that wrong incident. Meanwhile, the police say they have arrested key suspects in the murder of Sheriff Imoro, the soldier who was murdered. In a release on Friday, the police noted that the suspects were arrested through a sustained intelligence-led operation. We can now speak to the MP for our chairman, Mr. Ernest Nogbe. Mr. Nogbe, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear, and good afternoon to you. Good uh, afternoon to you too. I mean, it's been a tough week for you and residents of Asherman. We understand that the 184 suspects that were picked up by the military were, have all been released, correct? That's correct. Uh, after uh, yesterday, two days, night, uh, the remaining 34 were released into the community. I'm meeting them tomorrow. Uh, also to start them up to be able to integrate into the community and then reunite them with their families. And so that's correct. The 184 were all released as we speak now. That must be, that, that must come as a relief for you. I mean, seeing that they have gone through this kind of brutality. I mean, the, how do they respond? How do you respond to, to, to what has happened currently? Yeah, on one, on one side, it's, it's, it's a relief to me. On the other side, uh, I'm questioning the intelligence pickup by the military for the invasion because if, according to their report, uh, the statement they issued, they, were, they picked an intelligence uh, that the criminals were here and they invaded the whole place by brutalizing innocent, I mean, uh, residents of the community, arresting 184, but could not find even a single one culpable, then I doubt the intelligence they speak. Even though, yes, I'm relieved that the 184 were released, I'm still coming to terms with what might have necessitated the invasion and what compensation we are going to give to uh, 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 these people. And so uh, we, are, we are all devastated. As I said, I'm going to meet them to write some psychological uh, uh, I mean, uh, talks to them and then we see the way forward. We also understand that you're considering some legal action on this um, incident that happened. But where are we or where are you in, 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 in that current state of event? Well, uh, I'm making frantic efforts. I'm on the side of my people as well as on the side of the military and the family of uh, the diseased soldier. Yes. I, I, I sympathize with them. I was in their home. I even went to the burial service. I uh, had to meet the Defense and Interior Committee, etc. And what is most important now is the committee coming to the community and also having talks. Because as I met the committee and then the minister and the uh, military high command, they, they, they expressed shock and most of them admitted that there were excesses in their operation and so i asked them to come down and even talk to the people and again i always ask my people to remain calm not to take their laws into their hands not to 
uh, avenge whatever has happened to them during uh, uh, the raid. Uh, anybody they see in the community, they must accord that person the needed respect so that we don't have reprisal effects on, on this matter. And so we are doing so much uh, at this point to make sure that calm returns to Ashama. But as we speak now, there's so much calm. What is most pleasing that I am so much happy with is the police uh, arresting the perpetrators. Yes, I'm on the ground with the police. Uh, let me commend the IGP and his men. The IGP himself was on the ground. I mean, throughout the night, two, he was in Ashama 2 a.m. and left here yesterday morning around 7 a.m. He was on the ground uh, uh, to fish out the perpetrators. And thankfully, they were all arrested. And I'm so much happy about that. And I'll commend the police for that. And that is why I'm saying that these people are trained. The police, they are trained to effect arrest, to pick up intelligence and effect arrest. Soldiers are trained to kill mm -hmm. and to molest. And so when you release soldiers into a community, you are not releasing them to come and arrest any criminal. You are releasing them, releasing them to come and torment people in the community. And these people, even though the soldiers might have tempered with evidence by creating unnecessary tension in the community, the police have been on top of their, of their game to be able to arrest the the perpetrators, which I commend them of. And um, I'd like to know more about the police arrest. Do we know when these suspects will be arraigned before court? Or, I mean, well, are you picking up any information about the next line of action that will be taken against them? Yes, the, the, the IG will issue a statement in due course and will get the details of the number of people arrested. And uh, most of them uh, are even as convicts. Mm -hmm. You see, they, they, they are ex convicts in the community who have committed this crime. And so we are waiting for the police to conclude the investigation. And then they will arrange them before court. This one is, is left is in the bosom of the police and then the authorities that be. And so I will not delve into this so much. But we are still investigating one or two issues. Uh, I'm helping the police, I'm helping the institutions that be so that we get to the bottom of this matter. How soon are you going to court or petitioning Shraj on this case? Well, so many, I mean, institutions, I mean, international communities are calling on me and other, I mean, major institutions in the country are calling on, on us to petition Shraj and also uh, do the needful, of which we are gathering all the evidence. Initially, we asked all the victims to uh, report the matter to the police, to get medical forms, go to... I mean, uh, any uh, medical institution to get medical attention. We're collating all these things, and then by close of next week, uh, we should be, I mean, petitioning strikes or either going to the law court. If, if they fail to do that, we are going internationally. We'll go internationally because these people need justice. If this thing will cause the IMF from coming to Ghana, we will pursue it to the latter. We're grateful for your time, MP Enes Nogbe, who is MP for Ashama. Now, Minister of Defence Dominic Nitu says President Ekufado deserves special commendation for securing the Ghanaian people and preventing terrorist attacks. Ghana has largely been spared in a region where its neighbours have recorded such attacks. Speaking during the debate on the State of the Nation address, Dominic Nitu said Ghanaians must appreciate the level of security being enjoyed. The entire West Africa, particularly the big nations, are facing real security challenges. When I say real, extreme real security challenges, I can state that the nation that has been spared is Ghana. And so the president must be patted at his back. But he didn't try to do that for himself. All he did was to start from the border towns and let us know what he's doing to protect this country, especially making sure that our borders are safe. And so on page 13, the president starts to tell us that we are spending a lot of money keeping our security agencies at our borders to protect us. And rightly so, Mr. Speaker. Ten years ago, terrorism may not have been an issue to Ghana, Burkina Faso, or to even a few of the nations 
down south of West Africa. But today it is. If you cross the border to Burkina, and the major road between Paga and Ouagadougou, Waga, you may find it difficult to get about 10 cars moving on that major road. That used to have more than 100 to 1,000 cars moving. Because you do it at your own risk. Mr. Speaker, I know ministers in Burkina who want to come to Ghana and could have driven just two hours to Paga. But today they have to travel almost two days by aircraft to come to Ghana. We, take, we have taken security so we've taken security for granted because the security is good. And so even when West Africa security has deteriorated, Ghana has improved so much that five years ago, six years ago, seven years ago, you need a security escort from Kintampo, particularly in the evening, to Tamale. Today we don't do it. Now, on his part, ranking member on the Food and Agriculture Committee, Eric Opoku, berated the president for allegedly falsifying records in, in, in best address, in his address. As we speak, students who completed nursing training colleges and teacher training colleges in 2021, and they are at home today, government is owing them eight months of their allowances. Oh. Mr. Speaker, those who completed in 2022, last year, government owes them 13 months. And those who are in, the, in their second year, none of them have been paid a penny as an allowance. So yes, you claim you have restored it, but the true state is that government is unable to pay. Mr. Speaker, government also mentioned illegal money. The president mentioned illegal money and lamented over the debilitating effects of illegal mining on our environment and on the water bodies. Mr. Speaker, we wanted the President to update this House on the state of the fight against illegal mining. Because you recall that in 2019, the President came to this House and the House approved 30 million Ghana cities. Mr. Speaker, 300 billion oil cities for the President to fight the canker of illegal mining in this country. Today, Cocoa Board is reporting that illegal mining has affected 19,000 hectares of cocoa farms in this country. Mr. Speaker, as we speak, illegal digging and unregulated use of mercury by these galamsayers has affected 81% of cocoa farm lands in the eastern region, the president's own region. 74% of cocoa farmlands in the western region have been affected. In the Ashanti region, we are talking about over 68%. Mr. Speaker, these three regions contribute 90% of the total volume of cocoa that is produced in this country. So this will give you an impression of the state of the cocoa industry in our country today. Our farmers are losing their investments. Mr. Speaker, they are losing their source of livelihood. Now, the chief executive officer of OBZ Group of Companies, Enes Domini, has supported the whole central prison in the Volta region to enhance healthcare delivery to inmates. He donated an undisclosed amount of money to procure logistics to furnish the prison's health center to enable the inmates access basic healthcare without having to travel out of the facility. There's more in this report. As part of his contribution towards the well-being of inmates at the whole central prison, NS Domi financed the registration of the 420 inmates onto the National Health Insurance Scheme. This was to enable them access services covered by the insurance in times of need. Mr. Domi, who is the Chief Executive Officer of OBZ Group of Companies, made available an undisclosed amount of money towards equipping the prison's health center. And basically, I got to know that the infirmary of the prisons has been elevated to the statue of a, a, cl a, cl a clinic health center now. It's not a health center, it's no more an infirmary. So basically, I think because of that, I secured a deal with the health insurance authority for them to come and register all the image. 
so that at least when they register them, now that the thing has been elevated to a health center with a health insurance card, they'll be able to access some drugs and this thing for free before anything untold. So basically, that is what I felt like doing on my birthday. So that's why I came to just show this love to the inmate of prison. The prison is not, it's meant for everybody. We all know how to bring, ever bring you here. So it's just a way of showing my faith and love to them. He however admonished the judiciary to apply the law fairly. The real people are robbing us with pen and paper. For them, they know how to go for bill. They know when they, they, they are given the opportunity to even pay back. And they are still working on the street. And we are here and we say, well, custodial sentence and what? The judges know what to do. The prosecutors know what to do. The lawyers know what to do. I'm not going to tell them how to talk at the court. The judges can reason. The lawyers can talk. The prosecutors know what they are prosecuting. So custodial sentence, I've not been to law school. I'm not going to tell them that. What is the difference between a custodial sentence and a non-custodial sentence? They went to school and they learned it. So they should apply the law fairly, without any discrimination. The second in command of the whole central prisons, Francis Duce, implored the public to continue supporting the inmates since funds provided by the government are woefully inadequate. Starts really apart from what we have received, uh, prison has become an orphan. We need a lot of things for the prisoners, food items in particular and toiletries. Those are some of the necessary things that we, we need. Because as of now, we are feeding the prisoners on one CD 80 pesos, which is 60 pesos per meal. And then if you can see the food that they eat in the year, it's nothing to go with. We urge the general public that they have to emulate the sample of our brother and then come and donate so that our brothers will not be found lacking. We need Fred Kwame Asari. Joy News. Who? This is a Joy News show. We'll be right back after those messages. Welcome back to Join Newsroom. Now, vendors of the electricity company of Ghana have expressed their dissatisfaction with the company's decision to unilaterally increase the minimum quota they can purchase by more than tenfold. Many of the vendors believe the quota is too high and may force them out of business, leading to significant financial losses. Now, the move has sparked anger among vendors who are now calling on the ECG to reconsider its decision and also to find a more sustainable solution that takes into account the challenges faced by small businesses in the sector. Some of them spoke to my colleague, Blessed Soga, on the pulse. We've not been selling since morning. We don't have quota. It's 80,000 for, I mean, the four meters I'm running. We don't have the money to buy. And you see, another thing is, if I go borrow money, 80,000, to run this business, and then um, most of the customers in my area, they buy 10 CD, 20 CD. Yes, once in a while, you get the big buyers. But, um, you know, what ECD made us believe from the beginning is they are taking the service to the consumer to the doorstep and that's where we the vendors came in so we are just supposed to serve our community mm -hmm. so a community person that is buying 10 cd another is buying 20 then i go for a loan of 80,000 or 100,000 mm -hmm. to go and then be selling 10 10 cd and i'm paying a huge interest it's not business you... but buying 20,000 means getting the 20,000 in full and I mean, even our threshold, Momo, is 15,000. It's recently that they raised it to 15,000. Mm -hmm. Most vendors can't even get that amount of money for you. So you hustle, move from place to place. You go to the shopping malls. You go to different vendors. By the time you finish, that 400 and something that's supposed to be your commission, you've given it to vendors. Let's assume somebody is living in my area. Mm -hmm. mm? The person has to walk into the district office to go and buy a quota because I'm out of it. I'm out of this, uh, okay. the, 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 the work. Okay. The person has to pick a taxi or trotro. In and out, he's going to call the person six cities. The person is buying 10 cities. What is the sense in it? Yeah. It's meaning the person will not go. And what is going to happen at the end of the day is going to resolve yeah. illegal issues. Okay. I have nothing to do. Have to close now. We have, we have nothing to do. We just have to close it. Because no. what are you going to say? Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Nothing. Our hands are tied up. Then we can't do anything. Mm -hmm. Just have to leave it. That's it. From the first of this month. Mm -hmm. The 20,000 20, quota is starting. 
And it was just by... by, by, by just that this letter was written on the, on the 6th of uh, February. Just 6th of February, saying that first of this month is starting. And that is it. Okay. We are even just fortunate that it started yesterday. So what is going on? Now, family of a 27-year-old Abu Bakar Shahid was allegedly shot and killed by the police in Wa, disputing claims by the police that the deceased was an armed robber. This morning, close family relations, friends and some residents of Dondoli in the Wa municipality besieged the forecourt of the Upper West Regional Coordinating Council and the Wa Municipal Assembly and occupied walkways and stairs demanding that the police should denounce the armed robbery tag on the deceased and also his body released to them to be buried and the strict Islamic tradition. The shooting to death of 27 year old Abu Bakar Shahid allegedly by personnel from the anti-robbery squad of the Ghana police service in the upper West region has brought pain, anger and uncontrollable tears on close family members, friends, and residents of Dondoli, a suburb of Wa, where he hails from. Abu Bakr Shahid was allegedly shot on his way to visit a friend who is of an extraction on Wednesday night around Tembleju in the Dego electoral area where he met his untimely death. According to spokesperson of the family, Mohamed Tamimu, popular known as Kalusha, who also doubles as an uncle to Shahid, the latter had a call from his friend asking him not to come because the area was so safe. What happened that particular night? It was a flu man that called me. Malam, did you hear of Said? I said no. He called me that he's coming to pick me and I had guns out around our area. I decided to call him back to advise that he shouldn't come. Should the fire cease, then I can invite him to come. Lo and behold, Shahid picked to say that I'm already shot. I'm lying down there. Since then, I was calling him, I couldn't get him. Then I called the area assemblyman, that's the military area. He said, a good friend, that he should quickly rise there once I come. He went there, and the police refused to grant him audience. We try everything possible that we want to see our brother. The one who was shot, and they declined, is where not where he's where about. Until 10 o'clock, when the police team called back to ask of his name, the next morning, I asked my younger brothers to check at the various hospitals to see if they may leave him there to Alice rescue. Lo and behold, they went and found him at the regional hospital lying dead. Abu Bakr Shahid was accused by the police to be part of an armed robbery gang and the reason why he was allegedly shot. The family rapper denies this assassin by the police. Close family members this morning Call on the Upper West Regional Minister, Dr. Hafiz Bin Sali, with two things on their wish list. The armed robbery attack on Shahid should be denounced by the police and the body also immediately released to them for quick burial. If the police should admit that it was a straight bullet that gets to him, we all believe that death is real. Like in the verse, there could be nothing that he can not. Every living soul will taste death. Then we will take it like that do whatever we're supposed to do in the Islamic way, then we pray to God. But if they want to give a bad reputation to a small boy whom everybody known in the community to be very charitable, honest and obedient, there we said no, we won't agree. The minister promised to intervene. The leadership of the group who were in the company of the one municipal chief executive, Isa Kutari Moumin, however met a hostile crowd upon leaving the minister's office. They wail uncontrollable and some even lied on the quarry chippings laid floor and others became unconscious and were carried away. They later made a hustle stop in front of the Apostle Sudan Police Headquarters. It's not a higher, but it will never be. Ah, what is their problem? This time around, we are not ready for any nonsense. They should release the boy for us, then we'll know what to do with his body. What is it? I don't know what I'm Now we want to do, we are demanding that he's not an robber. They should accept that they missed their target. That is what we want now. We want justice for the guy. Upper West Regional Commander of the Ghana Police Service, ACP Prince Gabriel Wabo, 
call for calm. They want the police to clear the name of the desert. He is not an armed robber. And then they take him as weapons that they want him to be released to them for him to be buried under strict Islamic tradition. Reporting for Joy News, Rafiq Salam. Wow. We stay a while longer in the Upper West region where the Regional Minister Dr. Hafiz bin Saleh has called on stakeholders, especially traditional rulers, to commit to eradicate all structural barriers, discriminatory laws and practices, including all social norms that hinder women from achieving their full potential in the world of work. In a speech read on his behalf by the Chief Director of the Upper West Regional Council at the Regional 7th Women Expo Ghana 20. 23 regional Roshio series in Wa stated that the practice of giving out young girls in marriage violates the dignity of the latter and their human rights. The opening of the three day seven women's expo Ghana 2022 was launched with the celebration of the International Women's Day. A day set aside by the United Nations to celebrate globally acts of courage of women from all walks of life who have played extraordinary roles in their societies. This is the first time the Women's Expo Region Rosso Series has been held outside the Greater Accra region. Representing the Upper West Regional Minister, Dr. Hafiz Bin Sali, is the Chief Director at the Upper West Regional Coordinating Council, Peter M. Mala. He stated that the event provides a platform for women, especially emerging entrepreneurs who are doing well in their field of work. It also creates opportunities for them to promote their businesses and visibility for themselves. Peter M. Mala then elaborate on the theme of the International Women's Day celebration. As per UN Women's Gender Snapshot 2022 report, women's exclusion from the digital world has reduced 1 trillion US dollars from the gross domestic product of low income and middle income countries in the last decade. A loss that will grow to 1.5 trillion by 2025 without action. Reversing this trend will require tackling the problem of online violence, which a study of 51 countries revealed that 38% of women have personally experienced. The team also draws our attention to the importance of protecting the rights of women and girls in digital spaces and addressing online and IT facilitated gender-based violence. Here yes, stakeholders to commit to eradicate all structural barriers, discriminatory laws and practices, including all social norms that hinder women from realizing their full potential in their world of work. We resolve to end marriages of young girls and other harmful traditional practices that violate young girls' dignity and human rights as well as end violence against women. These are some of the greatest impediments to women's development in society. Events Director for Women's Expo Ghana, Nana Adwa Kwagri agree few more light on the event being here today is to celebrate the day with the women entrepreneurs that are here for them to come and showcase what they are doing we have different activities that are lined up for them as well free health screening hepatitis b hiv aids malaria bp um, what uh, hepatitis c they will be screened for free and everything that we are going to do here from tomorrow is free we have several activities beauty and lifestyle segments we have health and fitness we have indigenous cooking and all that so everything that we are doing here today is set aside to let these women network to let them have fun to let them learn from others and then interact with them founder of mara foods maria johanna expressed joy over the event and is hopeful that the participants will make the most of it uh, this is an occasion which would uh, bring together women in the region business women to showcase what we do in the region, how we can harness on the digital and technological knowledge that we'll be learning in the events that will be happening here, in all to enable to the benefits and then the growth of our various businesses. We are highly privileged to have had this occasion happen here. Reporting for Joy News, Rafik Salam. Wow. <laughs> Thank you.
Now, the labor that characterizes the pounding of fufu away has been done away some two decades ago. Now, the fufu pounding machine has made it a widely consumed delicacy easy to prepare. But how have Ghanaian engineers shaped up the technology of the machine to meet up modern demands? Our reporter, Lava Firm's Kwesi Deborah, looks at the evolution of the fufu pounding machine. The classic sound in many Ghanaian homes, loved by elders and children, but particularly kakufunos to young men. With tens of hits to achieve a soft swallow, food pounding is laborious, not to talk about the cones that mark the palms. But with the wide commercialization of the delicacy and advent of peace in lifestyle, a fast fufu became crucial. Ghanaian engineers in 2004 came up with a fufu pounding machine. First by Charles Fajinom and later Ken West researchers. Because the engineers wanted to make the machine culturally acceptable, the shaft which turned the fufu was made from wood. However, the wooden shaft's vulnerability made it Unsustainable. <laughs> From the cedar wood couldn't withstand the moisture in the food over time. This resulted in the breaking down of the wooden shaft, causing some of the wood pieces to find their way into the food. Again, the threaded hole wore off easily, making rotation impossible. The developers then thought of a permanent solution an old metal. <laughs> Now, the engineers at Swam Magazine have resorted to aluminium. Apart from the shaft, the frame has also been reviewed. This is an old frame of the foot pounding machine, made entirely from 20 feet of anger iron. And here, there's a new frame of the Fufu Pounding Machine made from 16 feet of angle iron. This is bigger and heavy, and that is smaller and portable. That is not all. The developers have added a ring at the base of the hole where the shaft fits to prevent the Fufu from spinning. Babasika is the brain behind this innovation. <laughs> This is a shaft of the foot pounding machine made entirely of aluminium. They can last you for about two to five years. The health implications of aluminium. Is it possible that this can be made entirely of stainless steel? I know, I know. Uh, engineers are up to the task. On Newsroom, I am Amisi Nyamiche Thompson. There's more news on myjoyonline.com.